Welcome to The Access, I'm your host, Hevi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing the maximum pressure campaign against the Iranian regime and the latest decision by President Trump to withhold airstrikes against the IRGC forces. Joining us to discuss this are Michael Pregent, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute, and Intifat Kambar, President of the Future Foundation and former Iraqi Deputy Military Attaché to the United States. Thank you so much, Intifad and Michael, obviously, for joining us again. We haven't had you on for a while. Uh, I do want to talk to you about the Iranian situation. I mean, there's, it's just escalating uh, beyond measures for people who didn't even expect the Trump administration to go as far as they've been going. Some people were disappointed that there was no strikes against the Iranian uh, IRGC after the uh, uh, downing of the um, drone airplane, but at the same time, others are saying that no, this is the right decision because it would have been, uh, if it's a limited strike, it's only going to help them. What do you want to comment on this? And because it's your first time with us, Intifad, please uh, start. Well, my comment is uh, if I have to choose between uh, winning uh, Trump the elections again or uh, downing or uh, uh, retaliating for the downing of the drone, which may lead to uh, a messy conflict that will only serve the Iranians. The Iranians, under the maximum pressure policy, are suffering, are choking and kicking, and this is part of their kicking process. So I don't think I don't think a, a, a reaction in a hasty way to uh, to attack Iran. As much as I want Iran to be uh, this regime to be eliminated, I don't think I think this attack, uh, considering all the war games and the scenarios. I think uh, Iran could do a lot of mess in the region, and that might be taken against him by his opponents in the elections, and he may, that might cost him the presidency. I think it's very important to have uh, six more years for President Trump because he's the only one who could deal with Iran, and he has proven so, and I think he should keep his eye on the ball and unwavered and continue these <coughs> sanctions. And retaliation militarily has his own time. He has the key to retaliate any moment he wants. He doesn't have to do it at the Iranians' timetable. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Michael? I mean, it's how, how do you view the response? And you've been invited to the White House on the eve before the decision on the airstrike was happening, and you were consultant with others uh, on this issue. So what, what do you, what's your assessment of the administration's so far handling of, of this crisis? Well, the president, by, by not striking, actually <clears throat> gave him uh, more credibility if he does strike in the future. Mm -hmm. Meaning he told the Iranians, listen, I could have killed 150 IRGC personnel. I chose not to. Uh, I've tried to open back channels to the Supreme Leader. The Supreme Leader has said no. I've taken this evidence to the UN Security Council. They did that yesterday in closed mm -hmm. session to present evidence that Iran was responsible, the IRGC Navy was responsible for the oil tanker attacks in, in the Straits of Hormuz and that the uh, UAV Global Hawk was in international wars. Mm -hmm. Of course, Russia and, and China vetoed, and, and the UN came out and condemned the attacks, but didn't blame Iran. So the president's now in a position. I mean, I love the cyber attacks as well. The president did a, an offensive cyber attack mm -hmm. against Iran's uh, uh, air defense capabilities, which actually left them blind and open to be attacked by Americans, mm -hmm. which is a capability we haven't used on Iran in 40 years. So it's beautiful in a way that the president now looks like the adult in the room. That's true. Trying mm -hmm. to keep Bolton and others from starting this war. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing I would say is I, I don't think this is ever going to be a protracted boots on the ground war at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran's a paper tiger. 80% of its population is, is tired of the regime. Uh, the regime is using brutal tactics to keep the population at bay. The sanctions are working, but what we keep hearing from the Iranian diaspora is the sanctions better have a strategy. I mean, we're okay suffering this as long as it leads to regime change. Mm -hmm. So the Iranians want regime change, but we can't get the, the administration to say they want it as well. But if you look at the details, if you look at those 12 steps that Pompeo has laid out, mm -hmm. it's regime change. If Iran does three of those, the regime collapses. Absolutely. Yeah. If they do all 12, the regime goes away. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So by design, they're set to set they're set to set the regime up for failure, and that's that's a good thing. That's very mm -hmm. true. And uh, this is uh, by not responding. I think I think Intifad might, might may agree here. The president has actually um, showed that this chaos campaign, this chaos strategy that the regime is putting in place, 
is backfiring. Mm -hmm. He didn't respond. So in that, I, I agree that we shouldn't attack Iran in its own timetable. Time time but now the next time they do something, we can do it and say, hey, we went to the UN Security Council resolution. Mm -hmm. Hey, we tried to talk to the Supreme Leader. And these new sanctions on the Supreme Leader and the uh, Setad, his conglomerate of uh, shell companies that are worth an estimated $90 billion to $140 billion, that's being targeted now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we need to make sure the Iranian people know is, as you're paying $6 for an egg on the equ equivalent of a $6,000 a year salary, your Supreme Leader is squandering away $140 billion. Yes. This mm -hmm. religious Maybe man. Maybe 200 billion. This religious yeah. man that's supposed to be there to make sure you're okay yeah. is saying, all of this is for me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's just something that we, we're going to target and we're going to make this regime feel pain. Another element of the, how corrupt and how bad this regime is to, to demonstrate to the Iranian <clears throat> people, in your opinion, Intifad, the fact that the administration even talked about striking the IRGC. I mean, this is the first time we hear this from an American administration in a very long time. Um, the fact that we heard this, is that enough? Or is having limited strikes could actually be more harmful than good? Uh, and what is the, the right way of approaching Iran, militarily speaking? Well, uh, look, I've been working in Washington almost continuously since the year 2000 when we overthrew the regime of Saddam with the help of the United States. And uh, I, would, I would probably say uh, with a lot of confidence, probably in five decades or four decades, this is the first time we see an American president who doing real politics. Mm -hmm. He's dealing politically with the issue of Iran. He's mastering the politics. He's, it's interesting, he's, he's a businessman, but he's doing politics much better than politicians, uh, presidents uh, before him. Mm -hmm. And I think the way as, as uh, uh, the, this 12 points are a master a mastering politics by not mentioning necessarily mentioning overthrowing the regime, mm -hmm. uh, and I th I think the situation inside Washington is not ripe for an attack now because there are some even Republicans against such an attack who like Rand Paul and others, mm -hmm. and so as Democrats I think by by dragging <coughs> the feet of the Iranians to make more mistakes that will galvanize support for. President Trump inside. In terms of corruption, I tell you one thing. Uh, it, it, corruption, I always tell people, corruption happens everywhere. It's in Washington, it's in Egypt, it's in uh, Salvador, any country in the world, there's corruption. The, the difference with corruption, Iranian style, that they use corruption to fund the IRGC. Mm -hmm. Every corrupt uh, official in Iraq is almost installed by design to do corruption and give away 20 to 40 percent of their corruption money uh, to, in order to launder their money through uh, so-called Islamic banks owned by the IRGC inside Iraq. Mm -hmm. So corruption is a way of life for, for Iran, is a mm -hmm. way of... Uh, and even the militia commanders like Qaisal Khazali has 4,000 people registered uh, on their salaries and they are... A very <coughs> very important sources tell me only 600 people are getting paid, 3,400. Now, these monies are not going to Qais, it's going to Qasem Soleimani, it's going to the pockets of Ubaid al mm -hmm. And I have exact figures how much they are looting Iraq and looting the region. Mm -hmm. uh, the Houthis, for example, loot money from the Yemen and go buy properties in Zahia Jinubiya, southern in southern Lebanon, of, of Beirut, yeah. where they are, uh, they are enriching Hezbollah and so forth. So corruption. And the Houthis. Okay. Yeah. So, so corruption is not a coincidental or a part of mismanagement of a country. For the IRGC, corruption is a designed way of life. Inside Iran, the sons of the mullahs drive the the most lavish cars, Porsches and and Lamborghinis. Well, the people, as he said, buying an egg for $6. Mm -hmm. And I have a very strong uh, connection in Kurdistan, especially in Soleimani. Mm -hmm. There are as many as one million Iranians now in, mm -hmm. in Kurdistan, Iraq. Uh, I'm, I'm one Kurdish friend of mine is a very prominent guy. You told me there are families now accepting a job, the whole family, for $100 a month. This is Iranian not, families. Yes, this is not caused by the sanctions of the United States. This is caused by the by the uh, mismanagement, mismanagement yeah. and the corruption of the regime. As we know that, uh, that uh, Khamenei uh, has in his position $200 billion, which most of it 
related to uh, uh, properties and uh, assets for the Shah of Iran, which was never handed to the Iranian government and kept for Khamenei to fund his own private projects. Wow. So, I mean, you know, the, the corruption is like, it needs an entire episode just on the Iranian level right. of corruption. And obviously, this is what the Iranian people are facing today with the maximum pressure campaign. Well, you know, the, the government of Iran spends $11 billion with their own admission in Syria and their militias. And in Lebanon, uh, they, they give uh, Hezbollah a billion dollar a year or maybe more, and in, and, and in Houthis as well, while the Iranian people do not have, uh, uh, they wait uh, five kilometers to get a piece of uh, frozen chicken. Yeah. So this is the case. I mean, what do you, what do you say about the American left that we see them crying out today mm. about the deal, about uh, the Iranian people, claiming that somehow there is moderates in Iran versus... Uh, the conservative. I mean, some, some, this is a, a very interesting uh, assessment of, of the situation in Iran. Um, how do you assess that, especially that now, I mean, we're seeing that this administration is, is going forward. I mean, it, the maximum pressure campaign, it is actually a maximum pressure campaign. The, the Iran was supposed to empower moderates. Mm -hmm. There are no, the moderates aren't in control. How do you empower the moderates when the supreme leader squanders away the assets, when the IRGC squanders away the economic benefits of the Iran deal. Uh, how do you empower moderates when it's the supreme leader who decides where the money goes? And if you look at where the money went, it didn't go to the Iranian people. It went to adventurism in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Lebanon. It went to bal ballistic missile testing. It went to a lot of other things. And, um, you know, I don't buy into this, this, this narrative that somehow if we got back into the Iran deal without renegotiating it, that somehow Iran would change its behavior. If the president does not win re-election in 2020, so Iranians, the regime is banking on the president losing. Mm -hmm. They're being told by Kerry and others, yes. wait, wait for Trump to go and then everything's going to be okay. By John Kerry now? He still talks to them? Well, at least a month and a month and a half ago, he was talking to them. And Senator mm -hmm. Feinstein met with Zarif and said it's literally the same thing over dinner. Wait out the Trump. Help is mm -hmm. coming. Uh, the, the issue is, if you're a Democrat who's going to win the election in 2020, if you don't renegotiate the JCPOA and you simply jump right back in, in the second term of a Bernie Sanders, a Kamala Harris, a Joe Biden, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Iran will be able to put a nuclear warhead on a ballistic missile and be in compliance with the JCPOA. Yeah. Because the sunset clauses run out in 2027 and 2030. And that would be in the second term. I thought it was 2025, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. early as that. So, mm -hmm. so Democrats have a great opportunity now to, to renegotiate from, from a position of strength after the sanctions, after the FTO designation, after all of these things, and simply saying uh, the president has caused all these problems, is ignoring the embarrassments that Iran put on the Obama administration day one mm -hmm. with arresting or putting sailors on their knees. Yes. 12 mm -hmm. sailors on their knees. No country in the world would do that to American sailors. Mm -hmm. But this archaic regime did it. Mm -hmm. Every other country would have said, hey, guys, turn around. You're in, you're in our waters. Or if something's wrong with their, their boats, hey, let's help you, and then you can go. Mm -hmm. Some sign of goodwill instead of this propaganda moment. Mm -hmm. This violation of the Geneva Convention. And that was towards the administration that was helping them. The that most. was the night. That was the night that President Obama was going to recertify the Iran deal or certify mm -hmm. the Iran deal. It was on the eve of his State of the Union address in January of 2016 mm -hmm. that Iran did this. Mm -hmm. And with every provocation, with, with propping up Assad, with inviting Russia in, with mm -hmm. doing everything they were doing in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and, and Lebanon, it was an embarrassment to the Ben Rhodes the Obamas, the mm -hmm. Kerrys, anybody who negotiated, the Wendy Shermans, who negotiated this Iran deal, it made them look foolish. Mm -hmm. Because if you're the Iranian regime, you want to sit across from Kerry, uh -huh. who didn't grow up in a rough neighborhood. You want to sit across from Wendy Sherman, who didn't grow up in a rough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You want to sit across from Ben Rhodes. You want to sit across from individuals that somehow believe that if they talk to you long enough, mm -hmm. you're going to believe the way they believe. Yeah. <laughs> That's the arrogance of the American who looks at Iran as as somebody as a pragmatic regime, as opposed to a a chess player who has the sole goal of making you look bad. And not only that, the action. I mean, there's the terrorist activities, the slaughter of innocent All of civilians, those things. killing Americans region, for forty years, killing Americans, uh, inciting you know hatred and, and extremism.
in the region. But I do want to ask about, you know, I mean, in terms of these people who are saying Iran complied with the deal, now the, the Trump administration threw the deal out of the window, what is the solution for the nuclear weapon? Now well, you're actually giving Iran a nuclear weapon. Well, first weapon. of all, not, this is that? not a nuclear deal by its own name. It's a strategic deal, which includes, I, I say, the nuclear thing is only the tip of the iceberg because the purpose of the deal is to have peace and stability in the Middle East and prosperity. That was not achieved. What happened is exactly the opposite. Because of this deal, Iran was in control, admittedly, and we know it as an Iraqi myself, of four countries in the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen, and have infiltration almost in every other Muslim and Arab country not to mention in the United States, not to mention in, in Europe, and not to mention in Germany. And Hezbollah is more, getting more aggressive against Israel, which is a, a strongest ally to the United States and to the modern uh, civilized world. So what I'm trying to say is what, is, what did we get out of this deal? Control of four countries? I mean, there's, if we look at the map of the world, there's only one single country in the world which is uh, s sending aggression is only Iran. Even North Korea stopped doing that. Even mm -hmm. China stopped doing mm -hmm. that. The Soviet Union does not exist anymore. This is a, 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 I mean, the IFGC and Qasem Soleimani, the Quds Force, they act as the Ministry of <coughs> Colonization during the British uh, uh, colonization era. Mm -hmm. They, I, I give you one example, and this is a real time example. Uh, for an Iraqi to get a visa to visit Iran, his passport visa does not go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for where the reef is. Mm -hmm. It goes to the IRGC Quds Force. Mm -hmm. The Quds Force control the tourism of Iraqis, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in religious and normal tourism of Iraqis. This is not this is not a military wing. This is the government. This is the real government. The IRGC That's, is the government. The IRGC is the government. Mm -hmm. And what you the see, regime, yeah. what you see of Rouhani and Darif is only a show of a government because all the decision making is either in the hand of Khamenei, which relies completely on the IRGC, and you can only trust the IRGC. And look what they did. They, they like this, this example so much, they want to make another Iraqi version of IRGC from al hajj al-Shaabi and the militias. Mm -hmm. And they did the same thing with Lebanon, where they put uh, Hezbollah in a position where they control the country militarily and politically. What are the options for the nuclear deal? I mean, what could we do to eliminate this problem? Because this is a potential problem that is up and coming well, the, the, so far. The beautiful part about the United States walking out of the Iran deal is it put everything on Europe, Russia and China. And, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but Russia and China do not want the Islamic Republic of Iran to have a nuclear weapon on their border. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They joined the Iran deal because the U.S. would be the guarantor. Mm -hmm. The U.S. would make sure Iran didn't become a nuclear power, and Russia and China could get military contracts, secure oil rights, and Europe could invest in an economy. Now, with the U.S. out, they all of a sudden become responsible actors. Uh, Russia has told Iran that the regime that any violation of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty is a red line for them. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. China is very pragmatic. If you look at what China's doing in Venezuela, China doesn't care if Guaido's in charge of Venezuela or Maduro's in charge of Venezuela, as long as their investments hold up. Mm -hmm. They're seeing such mismanagement in Iran that even though China's been pouring billions of dollars into Iran's economy, it's still being mismanaged. It's still falling apart because mm -hmm. the mullahs don't understand these things. Mm -hmm. They'd rather take the money to export the revolution. Exporting the revolution is more important than bringing down the cost of a chicken or an egg. Mm -hmm. Even though the egg and the chicken, the price is in the Supreme Leader's daily intelligence brief because mm -hmm. that foments uh, distrust of government. That mm -hmm. foments a revolution. That foments opposition. So what do we have to do? What we're doing. Keep the sanctions on. Mm -hmm. Watch. Um, Russia's going to let us know the codes for the S-300s. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about S-300s. Israel and the United States are ready to, to hit. Mm -hmm. Fardo and Parchin, if Iran rushes towards a bomb, mm -hmm. those, those military targets have even been mentioned by this White House and State Department as potential military targets. Mm -hmm. uh, they are outside of the Iran deal. Fardo and Parchin were part of the Iran deal. They weren't part of the inspections. And that's where the militarized testing of the Iran deal was taking place. So we continue the maximum pressure campaign and it's up to, I mean, if you look at the language of Russia, China, and Europe, 
stay in the Arondo, stay in the Arondo, mm -hmm. don't leave, don't leave. And Russia's threatening within the next, what, 15 days, 12 days, to walk away from the Arondo and increase its uh, enrichment of uranium. And that's going to isolate this regime further. It doesn't have any friends left. It has a surrogate, it has a lung in Iraq uh, on life support system. It they needs Iraq as a allies. lung. They don't have any and allies Iraqis in the world. And should actually realize yeah. it's yeah. time to break away. Yeah. It's time to break away from Iran. This is a shrinking economy mm -hmm. that wants nothing to do but use you. It takes Iraqi oil and sells mm -hmm. it back to them at double the price. What, what's in your opinion, Intifad? What's the solution? I mean, now Iran and Russia are saying that, that, that there's no more negotiations after with the United States. Look, is Israel going. is doing a very good job in Israel. being, in being mm -hmm. a middle middleman between Russia and the United States. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about this yeah, summit the, now. The, the Russians are helping Israel to attack Iranian targets. I've heard from very credible sources inside Syria, the Russians are not happy with the Iranian present presence inside mm -hmm. Syria. It's getting too crowded, per se. Putin mm -hmm. looks at Syria as his baby. Mm -hmm. He's, this is his last foot spot in the Middle East and probably in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And the Iranians demographic changes and bringing Afghanis and Iraqi Shias to resettle them and change demography, just like exactly what they're doing in Mosul in the Sunni land in Iraq, uh, is not making anybody happy. The Russians are very pragmatic. They want mm -hmm. to have a complete control of Syria, and they don't want to share this control with the Iranians. They don't have any interest in that, and the Iranians are making people, antagonizing people more and more every day. Mm -hmm. And also the Russians, really, they not, don't want to get antagonize the United States as well, and they don't want to antagonize the Israel as well, because mm -hmm. that's where the economies are, uh, that's where the money is, that's where the benefits is. I see, I mean, I may not sound very politically correct, I, I see there is a, a room for cooperation between the United States and Russia on that front specifically. Mm -hmm. I think the Russians are also very much afraid of Islamist extremism. Uh, the Islamist extremism is a very fast-growing a thing inside Russia, inside Moscow itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we could have some sort of a cooperation like the one that happened in the Second World War against mm -hmm. Hitler. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Iran, I think, I think there is a chance we, we don't have to agree with Russia on every single matter, mm -hmm. but I think there is a, 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 a room for cooperation on specific <clears throat> issues to uh, eliminate or weaken the Iranians' aggression mm -hmm. and Hezbollah specifically. And I might as well add there's Iran and there's Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranians had a historic the difficulty, even mm -hmm. before the Khomeini came to power, to cross, as my friend Fuad Ajami, the late Fuad Ajami said, to cross mm -hmm. the, the Arab barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Arabs will not accept a Persian or an Iranian to come teach them about Islam. Mm -hmm. what, what's effective, effective for them to invade Arab lands through Islamic ideology or Wilayat al Haqqi is Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. So Hezbollah has a very, very important role in that game. I think what Israel has been warning the world about Hezbollah, which some people thought they were exaggerating, turned to be very true. They are the most aggressive, and they are now in charge of Syria, and they are now in charge of Iraq, by the way. Hezbollah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed Kautharani is basically uh, was assigned by Hassan Nasrallah and the Iranians to run the Iraqi politics, and he's like the one who uh, makes Iraqi politics go the Iranian way uh, in a very smooth, and mm -hmm. Iraqis will accept him because mm -hmm. he is an Arab, he yes. grew up in Najaf, he's not an Iranian Persian. Mm -hmm. So this is what the danger, I think. This is the danger uh, of, of that, I think that all kind these of fronts, I think we should have some sort of alliance, maybe it looks like a weird alliance between Israel, Russia, and United States. And some uh, and all the people mm -hmm. who are loving peace and prosperity in the Middle East to overcome the, Rush, uh, the Iranian aggression in the region. However, Russia today was very clear on uh, saying that uh, they are fighting terrorism with Iran in Syria, which is very interesting to hear, knowing the collaboration between Iran and Al Qaeda, and the fact that they are actually doing the exact opposite in Syria, right. uh, and they're killing the civilians and, and helping extremists. Absolutely. Well, uh, I so, mean, no one, no I, one, no one should be mistaken. Is, the Russians are not; they're not no, angels by but all means. What I'm saying is that they don't agree with the United States and Israel. So today we saw that Russia is on one side, the United States and Israel is on the other side. Right in terms of Iran yeah. and Syria. What they're do you they're okay that? with Iran being in Syria to keep Assad in power. Mm -hmm. The Russians are not okay <clears throat> with Iran bringing in an offensive capability to target Israel. Mm -hmm. Because we've seen Russian forces sit on their hands 
when it comes to, the, to defending Qasem Soleimani's offensive operations in southern Syria by not using S-300s or a 400s exactly. to protect anything, mm -hmm. which led Tehran to, to wonder, well, what are you doing in Syria if you're not there to protect us? Exactly. Mm -hmm. The Russian mission is not to provide Iran a foothold in southern Syria or an offensive capability to go after Israel. It's for Iran's um, proxies, its militias, Lebanese Hezbollah, to help them keep Assad in power so they can maintain their naval base and their, and their other bases. I don't think you, Russia wants to control all of Syria. I think Russia wants parts of Syria. That's mm -hmm. And that's a better, better way to do these things because the United States has a comprehensive plan to fix everything and we suck at it. Excuse my language, we're not mm -hmm. good at it. Yeah. Um, Russia says, no, we're going to keep this, we're going to keep that, and we're going to try to influence these proxies in the north to sell us oil so that it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's the benefit of not having a press you have to worry about, not having an electorate you have to worry about. You can just do what you want, and Putin's doing that in Syria. Uh, what do you think? I mean, I want to ask you about a question that I just asked uh, Michael, uh, which is the solution for the nuclear Weapon well, the, but there's no, I don't think any deal with Iran will be viable. Look, I spoke to you before the program in mm -hmm. 2003. We, uh, as the Iraqi opposition, I was here in Washington. We mediated a deal between, we made, a, per se, an alliance of the Shia Kurds and the United States with Iran standing in the back and being neutral. Mm -hmm. And we thought, we thought that would be the deal that will make things work. Well, the Iranians, because they got this little deal, they, mm -hmm. under the skin of the deal, they were able to squander the Iraqi ex experiment. Uh, the removal of Saddam was a great cause, was the right thing to do, but because of the Iranians turning the Shia against the United States, which were supposed to be the next uh, strategic allies of the United States, turning the Shia early on, even when Bremer was there, the Mahdi army started aggressive operations. We all be nobody will believe that Saddam was a good guy. Nobody believed removal of Saddam was a bad idea. It's a good idea, but again, any b good project could be turned to hell because of the Iranian intervention. Mm -hmm. And the more you deal with them, the more you make deals with them, the more you are in trouble. I think the best way to go is to put your conditions very solid, very clear, and you ask them what to do, and if they don't apply, you you continue this maximum pressure policy, and that will take care of the regime by its own people. The Iranian people, <clears throat> look, I have, I worked in the Iraqi government. I was a spokesman for the deputy prime minister of Iraq. I worked in the council of ministers. I was the uh, military attaché here. Every uh, Iranian delegation who came to Iraq, which most of them are, are GC people, they will whisper to me they hate the regime. They will whisper to me they were, uh, they were happier with the Shah. And I was telling them, you guys are from the revolution. You're sons of the revolution. And they admittedly said, told me, whispered to me, they are not happy with the regime. So the own people of the regime are not happy. But what they are keeping it, because they know if they lose it, they will be crushed by the Iranian <coughs> people. Mm -hmm. So they keep the aggression and keep this corruption to suck out the uh, blood of the Iranian people and the, and the region. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, 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 like a gangsters, like a mafia controlling mm -hmm. a country. Uh, even they build, uh, they don't, so the, the ideology of the Walayat al faqih does not exist anymore mm -hmm. in the brains of the same people who started the revolution. To them now is a matter of uh, how to keep this regime going and how to make it stay in power because otherwise they would be crushed. Mm -hmm. Some people were talking about the United States being able to confront Iran in Syria because that was a, a best and easier way to confront Iran. We know that Israel has been confronting Iran in mm -hmm. Syria, but now after the trilateral uh, meeting, do you think anything is going to change about the American approach? Well, it's a free to fire Syria? zone in Syria. You can hit anything in southern Syria without consequence. To 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 uh, you know, it's interesting. Lebanese Hezbollah, Israel, Russia, and Iran are all all playing in southern Syria. When, when IRGC proxies from Iraq were launching rockets and missiles towards Israel, Lebanese Hezbollah said, it's not us, it's them. Mm -hmm. And Israel went in and hit Qasem Soleimani's proxies, the Iraqi militias, without consequence. Lebanese Hezbollah didn't do what people say in the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. They didn't launch a bunch of rockets and missiles towards Iraq, mm -hmm. towards Israel. They sat on their hands. Mm -hmm. They said it wasn't us, it was them. I don't think Lebanese Hezbollah is ready for this fight yet. They have seen saw what happened in 2006 and 2007. 
there needs to be a logistical land bridge, logistical support where Qasem Soleimani has primacy over that terrain. Mm -hmm. The Russian inactions to protect Soleimani have shown Iran that that logistical supply line, the Iran land bridge through Iraq and Syria, while it exists, it is still very vulnerable to air attacks. Mm -hmm. And Lebanese Hezbollah is not ready for this fight. Uh, I don't think Lebanese Hezbollah is going to attack any American interests. Mm -hmm. If the Houthis attack something, the Saudis and the UAE can handle it. Mm -hmm. If Lebanese, Lebanese Hezbollah does something, Israel can handle it. Mm -hmm. If Hamas does something, Israel can handle it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the U.S. mission is in Iraq, southern Syria, in the Straits of Hormuz, the Gulf of Aden, the Gulf of Oman, and Bab al mm -hmm. Well, maybe the border, Abu Kamal yeah. area, Al Tanaf, and Al Qaim. Mm -hmm. Those areas where we have American advisors uh, trying to push out the Hashid al Shabi along the border. And I think we're going to make a mistake here because we're saying we're just going to bring in the militias into the Iraqi military and put them in uniform and put them back on the border. Yeah. It'll be the same people. It'll exactly. be Hashid al Shabi wearing Iraqi uniform. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. We've got to stop thinking that somehow this concept of building institutions is curbing Iranian influence. Mm -hmm. We're building institutions to be co-opted by mm -hmm. the IRGC Quds Force. With the example of the LAF, doesn't mean everybody's Shia or everybody's pro Lebanese Hezbollah, but if you're quiet and you don't do anything and you sit on your hands and you allow Lebanese Hezbollah primacy, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Yeah. And that's what the Iraqi security forces are. They won't take on Qasem Soleimani's militias. Mm -hmm. They will not. Because if there were 15 of us in a room and we were going to do a raid on a militia, Two people in the room are tied to them and they would tell everybody that we agreed and we would disappear mm -hmm. and that mission would never happen. And that's the reality. And that's the reality that's in the Iraq. Reality. And I'm going to talk about that because you said very interesting things before the, we started recording this show. But I do want to ask about the S-300, the Russian response. You know, so the Russian response was not there when the right. Israelis did strike the Iranian militia. That's clearly, clearly a cooperation. I mean, clearly cooperation. Yeah, absolutely. What's going to change today after this meeting? I mean, is that well, uh, <clears throat> is there anything that's going to come it, out that's different than what it was before? I mean, was it yeah, uh, you know it, did it move things in the right the direction? Iranian, the way? Iranian economy is no longer an attractive investment exactly. opportunity. Exactly. So there's no love. It, it's lost sixty percent yeah, between Russia and Iran. It's lost its sixty percent of its value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's lost its attractiveness to invest. Mm -hmm. You can't touch the Iranian economy because. 20% of it is controlled by the IRGC, who is a foreign terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. In Washington, D.C. That was a very smart decision, by the a way. A lot of my colleagues said, oh, the FTO designation doesn't mean anything. It's mm -hmm. nothing. It means everything. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and the FTO Why? designation, well, because it makes everything toxic. Mm -hmm. So everybody focused on what were Treasury's equities with FTO designation, the foreign terrorist organization designation. Or what are State Department's equities? Nobody talked about DOD. Mm -hmm. DOD's equities are now, if the IRGC Navy does something, it's a foreign terrorist organization. You can hit it. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier. And, and the, we do not need to get congressional approval to hit Iran. No. You need to get congressional approval to go to war with Iran. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But to respond to, to an declare attack a war, uh, to be, immediately, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the position we're in. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the week, we have a, a, a strike against a proxy or a strike against one of these radar sites the next time Iran does something provocative. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, because now they've been showed, hey, you have the president. They have president. no other solution. Yeah. Yeah, that's who, the only way they can. Who's I mean. going to show constraint until you do something. So you're going to have to do something to step it up. You want the president to do something so that the world can say, look, Trump, Trump did this, Trump attacked. But now I think that narrative is going away. This is backfiring. Mm -hmm. If Iran does something, and we, again, show evidence that they did something, I think the international community will be fine with a limited strike. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. the thing is, the Iranian people are not going to rally behind the flag if a battery, a missile battery, is hit, or if the IRGC Navy is hit while conducting a sabotage attack on oil tankers in the Straits of Hormuz. And in Iraq, the Iraqi people are not going to rally behind the flag if we target Qasem so we, if we target Qasem Soleimani, or Abu or Mahdi. if we target, tar <laughs> target Abu Mehdi al Mohendis, mm -hmm. Case Ghazali, they're not going to rally around the flag. Iraqis mm -hmm. are tired of these, these militias tied to Iran. 80% of the country is tired of Iran. Sadr wants these others marginalized, and it's a great opportunity. But if you look at what, what Intifad's been, been, been following in Iraq, the militias are scared. Mm -hmm. Militias are quiet. Militias are going away because they, for the first time since the invasion of Iraq, believe 
they are now targets mm -hmm. of the United States. Yes, too. Yeah. Uh, even though we arrested them, we didn't kill a lot of mm -hmm. them. We arrested them and we let them go if they promised to be good. Mm -hmm. We should have Ghazali, them, we should send them to Gitmo. Yeah, but Case Ghazali <laughs> was released and, and continued to do everything else. Anyway, yes. yeah. uh, this is different. Yeah, the FTO I'm, destination I mean, I, changes I'm everything. I'd like to say you one say thing. Something? As, oh, an, as, an, as an Iraqi American and from the region, grew up in Iraq, served in the Iraq, Iraqi war, I think it's time for many countries to least take action against Iran. They don't, we don't have to wait for the United States to take action. I think Israel is doing the right thing. They're mm -hmm. taking action against their uh, tactical uh, <clears throat> attacks against targets inside Syria, which are imminent threat to them. Mm -hmm. There are even rumors or uh, a lot of evidence Israel hit, hitting some targets inside Iraq mm -hmm. you know, of some, some militias. I would encourage the United States to... Uh, 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 to give Israel more, uh, uh, you know, don't don't tie their hands and mm -hmm. give them. And I think the Saudis should do the same, mm -hmm. and I should think the Emiratis they should do the same. They have a lot of cruise missiles and their storage is getting rusty, mm -hmm. unused, and a lot of F-16s, beautiful ones, need to be uh, yeah. used for for purposes You're other than other than hunting. You're basically saying there should be a season. regional war against the Iranian no, no, no. regime or the No, not a war, but I'm saying but I'm just, saying just hit its military capability, it, not its civilian. If they strikes. hit you, if they hit you, it's very very fair. Mm -hmm. Or they are establishing Israeli a, style uh, yeah. style airstrikes exactly, exactly. against the IRGC uh, and surgical the strikes. Mm -hmm. If you if you're building a missile factory near Damascus. It's completely fine for Israel to hit it, mm -hmm. and it's completely for Saudi Arabia to hit one next to Sana'a in Yemen if they're doing the mm -hmm. Houthis. And that's what should happen. I think if I, I, I called many of my uh, Gulfy friends, some of them very prominent from royal families, and I told them, listen, you don't have to wait for the United States to take action against the IRGC uh, 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 boats. You can take a few boats out uh, mm -hmm. as a retaliation for hitting your tankers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I think President Trump has very been very clear about this. I mean, the uh, people in the, in, in the region should take action and the United States will back them logistically and strategically. Mm -hmm. And if the United States intervene at some time, that's fine. But if you have to defend yourself when, when, uh, when the danger is imminent on mm -hmm. your border, and I think uh, we need to work on that. And I think the... So not to wait for the United States response, just respond with I mean, there should be cooperation, strikes. obviously. I, at, uh, yeah, there should be co I'm sure Israel is cooperating mm -hmm. with Washington when hitting these targets. What, what could Iran do to make it even harder for the regional actors? Um, given that they are kicking, they're they, suffocating, look, Iran, Iran they're not... Consistently, nobody offering from them my experience in Iraq, their main reliance on their proxies. They mm -hmm. have proxies inside. They have... Uh, sleeping cells inside Saudi Arabia. They yes. have sleeping cells in London, as mm -hmm. they found out. Yes. They just found out another one in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. They have sleeping cells in Bahrain. They have sleeping cells in Qatar or in Emirates. Yeah. And they want. They will. They 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 think they can trigger them out to uh, cause instability and problems inside these countries. When there's time, when the time yeah, comes. Yeah. But I think I think the more Iran is going to get weaker, the more those proxies becomes uh, they become <coughs> uh, you know. B b Loose and, I mean, and and they're not getting get, not getting paid and I think it's also I think because the religious ideological element is getting much weaker mm -hmm. at the expense of money and power and I think if Iran becomes weaker uh, a lot of people will abandon Iran including their proxies. I mean mm -hmm. the, the narrative needs to go out that Iran has to rely on Arabs, Iran has to rely on Pakistanis, mm -hmm. Iran has to rely on. Af Af Afghans. And we have a proverb: see, Iran fights under the last Shia Arab. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and they don't That's fight. They, they don't Europe, fight right? with their own people. So mm -hmm. the IRGC Navy is a legitimate military target, mm -hmm. and these proxies uh, should learn the lesson that Qasem Soleimani couldn't protect his own forces in southern Syria. Mm -hmm. He can't protect you anywhere. And you never see Qasem Soleimani surrounded by Iranian fighters, mm -hmm. either Iraqi fighters or Houthi fighters, mm -hmm. or they're all Arabs. Mm -hmm. They 100% rely on Arabs. Mm -hmm. they, they are able to transform their battleground from Tehran to Baghdad, from Tehran mm -hmm. to Beirut. Mm -hmm. yeah, we need the Arabs to say right. halas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, enough. Yes. enough. Yeah. yeah, enough with that. Um, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to talk about what's happening inside of Iraq because Iraq is also the place where the United States is asking to for increase of oil uh, production 
Iran is threatening American interest in Iraq. I mean, Iraq is going to be a main battlefield in this ongoing situation between the United States and escalation between the United States and I Iran. In your opinion, I mean, what, what is going on internally? And both can of I you are experts on this. Sure. Yeah. So, so the Americans yes. are putting a defensive capability into Iraq. Mm -hmm. Patriots, a counter-fire battery system, meaning if you launch a rocket, automatically there's a response and it's, mm -hmm. it's taken out. Uh, I think the United States strategy will be to put in a defensive capability, absorb Iranian attacks, absorb them, let them launch rockets and missiles, or shoot them down uh, until they kill an American mm -hmm. or until they injure an American. Then it's a different story. But I think we're going to absorb these attacks, these harassing attacks, and then every day just add something else to it, mm -hmm. add another sanction, make Iran look desperate, keep mm -hmm. pre presenting intelligence to the international community, keep talking to Democrats in Congress and the Senate and to Rand Paul and these Republicans. But we have to get away from this narrative that somehow uh, there are moderates in Iran that can change all of this. Because mm -hmm. they can't. They uh, can't. There's no such thing. The, uh, I was talking to somebody from the National Security Agency who said that uh, Zarif and Rouhani are constantly complaining about the IRGC mm -hmm. and that they want to do something. I said, they're messaging you. They said, what do you mean? I said, okay, first off, if they're on the phone, they know the IRGC is listening, so mm -hmm. why would they criticize the IRGC in Iran? Mm -hmm. And they know that if they criticize the IRGC and you listen to it and you write it down, that it helps them with this bullshit narrative, excuse my language, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get that out of there, yeah. that somehow they're moderates. Uh, I would say, so it keep, helps I would say keep it. <laughs> so, so, so it helps them. So they, they know how to co-opt our intelligence community. We had the Air Force defector, the, the, the female sergeant who defected to Iran, who taught them how to manipulate signals intelligence and how to man, uh, burn a human, a human intelligence network. Mm -hmm. And she was one of these people that provided the Iranians yes. all these names of, of, Amer of Iranian uh, people that were working with our agencies. Uh, and we, got him killed. The, the weird mm -hmm. woman from yeah, yeah. Town and, and, and got him killed. So, so, so this we got to get away from this narrative that somehow, if we just empower the moderates in Iran, everything will change. Because you can't, you can't do it because the regime, as soon as they identify a talent, somebody who disagrees with them, somebody who's charismatic. Mm -hmm. They make them go. There's away. no moderates. They yes. send them to Evan Prison. Regime. They, mm -hmm. When you have a totalitarian regime, there's, there's the mice, there's yeah. the sheep, and there's the regime. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I tell you one thing about Iraq. Very important. Mm -hmm. There's two issues in Iraq. One of them is a huge problem, the biggest problem, uh, and the second one is the biggest opportunity. Mm -hmm. Not only for the United States, for the world. The biggest problem, Iran. Everywhere else, they spend money. The only country they make money from is Iraq. Yes. In fact, the money that comes from Iraq, they spend it on uh, uh, Syria and, uh, and Lebanon now and, and Houthis. And that's why you have Hezbollah in charge of the business of Iraq. That's a huge problem. Therefore, to shut down businesses of IRGC in Iraq and those militias, the Iraqi government gives $2 billion budget line to the militias, which, which is basically funding the IRGC. Mm -hmm. That's a big challenge for the United States, but has to be tackled, has to be resolved. That will deprive Iran of a huge hole or loophole for funding their operations of terror all over the world. The second issue is uh, we have to uh, look that Iraq has eight years of war with Iran. I fought in this war. I've, I lost four cousins. There's half a million Iraqis killed there. Those Iraqis, even dead in their graves, has been deprived of their rights by the Iranian, uh, pro-Iranian uh, government in Iraq. Mm -hmm. This is not going to go away. There's a huge amount of, of uh, bad blood between the, Iraq, the, uh, the Iraqi people and Iran. So as the people in power, you know, mm -hmm. I'm told that Qasem Soleimani was injured during the war with Iran 13 times. Mm -hmm. I've sat down with some Iranian officials who said that we will never forget the, the way we were humiliated by the Iraqi army, which mm -hmm. basically we took over five major cities mm -hmm. in in very short time. Yes. So this, the relation between Iraq and Iran is different from Ira Iran and, and, and Lebanon, where mm -hmm. Iran is giving them like a welfare mm -hmm. system. They're providing them with money, opening schools for them. With Iraq, there's a bad blood, mm -hmm. and there's also sucking out the resources. So the Shia of Iraq realize those people are not going to like us, even if we are Shia, because we fought Iran. 80% of the Iraqi army which fought Iran was Shia. Yeah. 
And so, so, so there's a history there. Is there's that a the history there, and there's also a sucking of money. Mm -hmm. That's why you see people in Basra months ago yes. went and burned the Iranian consulate. Yes. This is the hardcore of Shiism of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why you, you, now the, the, the dismay. And so there's an opportunity there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity and also a danger mm -hmm. of, of using Iraq as a, a, or continue to use Iraq to fund their terror operations where uh, is, uh, Tahanan is bankrupt. You wanted to say something, Michael? Well, I mean, is there an opportunity there? When the Bazawaris burned down the Iranian consulate, the United States government condemned them. Mm -hmm. Brett McGurk condemned yeah, them. It's very, yeah, it's And we very... shut down our consulate. Oh, don't, don't, so don't, don't remind me of this. But it's an opportunity squandered because mm -hmm. the United States needs to open up the consulate, get back in there, and listen to Iraqis and not to Baghdad. Yes. 25% of the electorate voted in this election, mm -hmm. and it got them the Bina Party, which is a combination of Prime Minister Maliki's party, state mm -hmm. of law, and Fatah party from Hari al Amri and all these militias. And Serayun has already been marginalized, mm -hmm. Sadr's party. So we got to stop listening to the Shia political parties tied to Tehran mm -hmm. and start listening to the Iranian people. Or the Iraqi people, exactly. they want American investment, American education system, American entrepreneurs. They want to stop seeing suits mm -hmm. and they want to stop seeing military guys mm -hmm. in their country. Yes. And they want to start seeing entrepreneurs, professors, people that invest. 80% of this country is finally telling us, help us get Iran out. And I don't buy this argument that because they're a neighbor that somehow we just have to deal with this. I mean, Canada's mm -hmm. a neighbor. They don't decide who our president is. Mexico's mm -hmm. a neighbor. They don't have primacy over our politics or our mm -hmm. military. Yeah. Iran has both of those things. Three, they're in their economy as well. Iran's penetrated Iraq's economy, decides who their leadership's going to be, and has primacy over their armed forces. Mm -hmm. When I say primacy, they have marginalized them to the point where the armed forces are ineffective against Iran. And nobody should pretend this is okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. people act like it's So, it's, I mean, it's there is, happening. we know that this happens specifically uh, during the last administration and we will talk about this in another Under this uh, administration interview. as well. Yes, in the beginning because like you said until Brett McGurk McGurk left, people, until Mattis left because Mattis was part of this also. Mm -hmm. So there were people who were to keep kept enabling the same policies Mattis and McGurk in your kept saying Iraq is mm -hmm. not a problem, Iraq is not in the Iranian sphere of influence and as you yes. see now everything bad happening in Syria Mattis is refused to say to believe to say there's yeah. a bridge, the land bridge. Because so Iraq is no a permissive bridge. environment. Yeah, yeah, Mattis yeah. said it doesn't exist. Well, doesn't it exists. Exist. I mean, Mm -hmm. It's a joke. It exists. Yes. It exists. So I, I do want to, you know, because we were talking about the romanticism of, of the left in America, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Democrat a little bit, not everybody, but, you know, more of, on the far right. left democratic side uh, towards Iran. And the Iranian regime is attempting to hold off now. I mean, this is probably their, their strategy until Trump, they're hoping that Trump is going to be voted out of office. How long can they last? Could they last that long with this maximum pressure? 16 uh, months? Yes. Could they last that long? And what would be the consequences for them? And, and I mean, what does that mean in terms of holding off? Well, I think um, the next 16 months are going to be very painful. The next four years or five years and 16 months are going to be uh, would bring down the regime mm -hmm. if we kept the maximum pressure campaign in place. I'm concerned that a transactional president, President Trump, will, will, will see some sort of a deal uh, with the regime or make a deal with the regime that empowers it, that legitimizes it, and that kills the opposition, mm -hmm. that kills the forces in Iran that are looking for a change in government, that are looking for freedom. Who's the transactional president? You're president about Trump. That he would you know, give a, a deal He's now? looking for a deal. He's looking for a deal. He's a businessman. He yeah. He's looking for a transaction. You do this, But we he do now that. included the ballistic missile program, and obviously no, they're going to want to include He needs to do that, things. yeah. But what type of deal could Iran offer at this no, point? The, that's is, the beauty of the 12 steps. Even yes. if the president says, we only want you to do these three, it's regime collapse. Mm -hmm. Or pick these three, regime collapse. Or these three, regime collapse. Mm -hmm. There are four different packages, maybe unlimited number of packages in these 12 statements mm -hmm. that will bring the regime down. Get, get something out of it that brings the regime down. Mike, I just don't want to see, I don't want to see uh, a, a, you know, any capitulation or any legitimizing of this regime. Mm -hmm. This is working. The mm -hmm. president has just been able to say, we spared the lives of 150 IRGC men so they could go back to their families and wonder how they're going to pay for eggs the next week. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, we presented intel to the international community. 
the next time Iran does something, the president's going to say, listen, I'm trying. Yeah. Let's do this and this and that. And, and Iran will respond, and then you have to respond forcefully again. And then they will come running to the table. If the president wins re-election, they'll come running to the table. Yes. If the president doesn't win re-election, they'll come limping to the table, and it'll be a great opportunity for the president, or the next president, whether it be a Democrat, to re-engage in the Iran deal and address sunset clauses, ballistic missiles, terrorism, uh, inspection of all sites, and 24-7 inspections by IEA to include U.S. inspectors, mm -hmm. and then have it ratified as a treaty so that the next president can't just come in and tear it up. Okay. That's what happens when you do things by, by fiat. I want to thank you so much both. This is a, an ongoing conversation and would love to have you again. Thank, thank you, you so much. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.